Good morning. Happy Sabbath to you. As we take time once now to get into God's Word. It's been a wonderful worship service so far. But now it's time to spend a little time in the Word of God to see what He has for us prepared today. Do you see a stork on your screen? <laughs> okay. Today's animal is a stork. And we're doing the animal series. And... Uh, we're going to let you look at the picture for a moment. This is, uh, I'll tell you in a, I'll tell you, is it, am I too loud? Hmm. Let's try. All right, I'm going to try this over here. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you in a, uh, a little bit why the stork is relevant to today's sermon. But right now, I'll tell you that the title of the sermon is, Do You Know What Time It Is? And I hope you gain from the sermon. It's, I want it to be a personal sermon for you in that to think about these questions as we consider, do you know what time it is? Questions to think about is, are you aware of the times that you live in? both personally and in the world we live in today. And the qu other question that goes with that is to think about, do you take your salvation and your relationship with the Lord seriously? How serious do you take your relationship with the Lord? Think about that and think about the times we live in. Do you know what time it is? Today's animal, the stork, I picked it because ant storks, uh, like other birds, know what time it is. Here's some fun facts about a stork. Did you know that they uh, communicate with one another by clattering their beak? They, they clatter their beak together and that's how they communicate. Storks eat frogs, fish, and insects. And because of that, their habitat is in marshy areas and also in rivers and ponds. A group of storks is called a muster of storks. Storks are known to soar and glide through the air as a way to conserve energy. When they're flying, they actually glide. A wingspan of a stork can be up to 10 feet 6 inches. And that puts it uh, close and similar in wingspan to the condor. Now, another thing about the stork that's interesting, another fun fact, is that they have folklore about them. And I didn't plan it like this, but it's interesting. We had a baby dedication today. <laughs> and we're talking about storks because storks are, no, are, by folklore, to be the animal that brings babies to parents. And I researched and I learned that this got its start in Europe. It's a European folklore that storks would find babies in caves and marshes and bring them in a basket held by their beak to expecting parents. And what parents would do is they would create like some kind of dessert or sweet and put it uh, on a windowsill to let the stork know, hey, we want a baby at this house. <laughs> and the stork would come and bring the baby and take the treat. That's, of course, legend. I mean, that's folklore because we know it's made up. It's interesting that human beings devise these wild stories to explain where babies come from. But you may have heard this too, that sometimes a birthmark on a, on a baby is called a stork bite. Have you ever heard that before? <laughs> Where the stork bites that baby. Anyway, th that's just the folklore of storks. But another fact about storks is this, that they are called migratory birds. Now a migratory bird is what you think of. They're birds that migrate from one area to another area during changings of the season. When it gets cold, they leave the cold and they go somewhere warm. Storks know what time it is. They know when it's time for them to leave where they're at and go somewhere else. They're aware of the seasons. They're aware of the time. 
they know instinctively, I need to move. I need to do something. And so we use this stork to tell us, do you know what time it is? Are you aware of the times you live in and realize there are times in your life you need to take action? You need to do something with your life. This is what we're learning from the stork. Now today's sermon is somewhat... Uh, a lot of times I do expository. This one is more topical. So I'm going to have several different verses today. The first one is found in Matthew chapter 16, verse 1 through 3. Matthew 16, verse 1 through 3. Now, I'm going to read this to you and then I'm going to show you a picture in just a moment. Matthew 16. Then the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and testified to uh, and testify and excuse me. They came and testing him, that is Christ, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites! You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Now, I have a photo that uh, we're going to show you on the screen. I'm going to see if I can see it. <laughs> Alright, this is a photo of a red sky. Now, this photograph, I took this photo last week at Dover Camp. I was there with the, during the work week helping out, and western Oklahoma has, I think, some of the prettiest sunsets in the whole world. And every evening, at the end of the work day, I would go to the that western edge of the camp, you know, over there where people park their... RVs and things and look across and I would see the sunset and one day the sun was going down and it illuminated the entire sky that red color right there and it's interesting because red weather at night means the weather will be fair and the next day guess what the weather was not very nice and pleasant there was no wind I mean very little wind it was sunny it even though it was the, the air was cold and we were bundled up in our jackets and hoods, it's, it actually felt nice because uh, the wind was calm and it was sunny. And so the, the weather was fair. The, the red sky the night before predicted the fair weather. So Jesus Christ used that as an example to say, look, you can look at the sky and tell, and tell things. You can discern what the sky is telling you but you're unable to discern the times that you live in to know, for instance, that they were rejecting Christ, not realizing that He was the Son of God, and that you're rejecting Me. You're unable, to, you're unable to tell that. You can tell the weather by the sky, but you're unable to tell that you need to come unto Me. So this is an uh, example. I wanted to show that photo to you. All right. So we think about knowing what time it is, let's first think personally times in your life. Turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter number 3. This passage tells us that there is a time for everything. Let's read this and then let's think about a few of these. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 through 8. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. 
a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. We consider all these different times of life. For instance, we had a baby dedication just a little while ago. We saw for Dakota it was his time to be born. He was recently born. So there's a time for every one of us to be born. But we also know that there's a time for every one of us to die. My grandmother died on November the 18th. And we knew and we spent time with her there at the end that we, we just knew this is the end of her life. It was her time to die. And she experienced that. It's something we all experience. What about also there's a time to weep and mourn? There are times like when you lose a loved one that it causes you to weep and be mournful. And that's okay because there's a time for that. It's not wrong to mourn. But there's also a time, it says, to laugh and to dance. Yes, the Lord can heal you of your mourning and your grief. It, tell, it tells us right there in verse 3, a time to heal. God will heal you of your grief. What about where it says, a time to break down and a time to build up. I was thinking about that whenever we were last week working at Dover Camp and we were building a brand new building and how exciting it is. A new building is going up. It's time to build. But the reason it was a time to build is because all we had to do is look over to the west and see these two empty spaces where those old buildings used to be. There is a time for them now to be torn down. Yes, a time to build up and a time to break down. Those buildings had to be brought down. They, they served their purpose. They came to the end of their use. They were brought down at a time now to build up. And similar I see in verse number 6, a time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. Have anyone here ever tried to clean out a closet? And you have all these things and you realize, why do I keep on holding on to these things? There is a time to keep some stuff, but there comes a time you have to throw it away. There's a time to let go and move on. There's a time, a purpose for that. There's a time where you have to learn to let go and move on. There's a time for all these things. And here's a few extra for you. These are not in Ecclesiastes. These are from Barry. Here's a few things to think about. What about there's a time to learn? When you're a child, you're in the learning mode. You go to school, right? But did you know there's also, as you grow up as an adult, still time to learn? We should all be growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We should always have time to learn. What about a time to dream? That is a time to ponder your life and think about what's going on in my life and what do I want my life to become? What do I want to achieve in life? There's a good time to, to dream about what I want to do with my life. What about a time to enjoy? Now that I think is in here. A time to laugh and a time to dance. Do you ever take time just to enjoy life? You've heard the phrase, don't let life pass you by. <laughs> you get so busy with life that you forget to stop and enjoy it. It's good to enjoy life. To relax sometimes. To take care of your health. Yes, it's, it's good to take that time. Are you taking the time to enjoy life? But we also know there's a song in our songbook that says, Take time to be holy. Do you take time to be holy? Do you take time every day to worship the Lord, be in prayer, to consider what He's done for you? Do you take time for, for God? What about take time to spend with others? Sometimes we get so busy because we realize we have all these tasks to do, but we do that at the neglect of taking time for other people. I know for me sometimes I have to tell myself it's not so important to do a task 
if I have the opportunity to spend time with someone. Yes, spending time with other people and investing in them. I think about that when we come to church. We come to church for a lot of reasons to worship mainly, but I really believe we come to church in order to be with one another, to take time to be with each other, because we're building relationship with one another, because we need each other. Do you take time to spend with other people? Do you take time to invest in the lives of other people? What about parents? Do you take time to pour into the life of your children? Don't let parenting be an afterthought. Make it your priority. Because, do you know what time it is? <laughs> if you have children at home, they're not going to be there very long. For those who have adult children, you know a child's time with you is very short. You have limited time with them. Take time to invest in your children. Don't make it an afterthought. Make it a priority to invest in your children. Teach them about Christ. Pour into them because one day they're not going to be under your roof. They're not going to be under your authority. This is the time to seize that opportunity to pour into the life of your children. Take time to pass down your wisdom. James 4.14 tells us, What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while, a little time, and then it vanishes away. When we were out there at the Dover camp working, it was in the mornings, it was like, you know, in the lower 30s. <laughs> and as we talked and breathed, you could see your breath coming out of your mouth, and you'd see the vapor, the, that cold vapor in front of you. But, you know, you would say something, and it would appear for just a little time, and then it would, what, disappear. You would see it, but then it would be gone. And James writes, that's what your life is. It's here for a while, then it's gone. Your lifetime compared to the eternity <laughs> is just like a water vapor that appears and it is gone. Do you know what time it is? Because time is running out. I believe there's two things that prevent us from taking the time. One I've mentioned already is that we get too busy. It's good to be a diligent, hard worker, but it's not good when they become a distraction to the point that you don't take time for the more important things. Do you remember in this Bible, Martha and Mary? Christ admonishes Martha because she is so busy running around the house and says, Martha, Martha, you're busy and worried about many things. But Mary has chosen the better part. She has taken time to sit at my feet and learn from me. Don't let busyness prevent you from taking time to do what's important. And that is mainly developing your relationship with the Lord. How important is your relationship with the Lord? Is it important to you? Or is it merely an afterthought? And the other thing that prevents us from taking time is we get way too comfortable. When things are going good, when we have all the material things we feel like we need, when we're pleased, when we're entertained, we don't take the time to do what's important. It can be very dangerous to become too comfortable to the point that we ignore what God wants us to do. God has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light for a reason, a purpose, Everyone has a purpose. Now you must live out that purpose. Are you taking time to do what God has called you to do? I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, as we think about taking time. Time is mentioned here in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, I want to first read verse number 8. Ephesians 5.8 For you were once darkness, but now you are a light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now that verse is familiar. It sounds very, it sounds very close to the verse in Peter where he says you've been called out of darkness and into His marvelous light. See, when you invite the Lord in your life, it's because He's a brought you out of the darkness in the world 
And now you're in His light. You're walking. It says, walk as children of light. Now look down to verse 14. Therefore He says, Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Does that verse sound familiar? That's, we learned that in Bible school a couple years ago. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Paul is saying, wake up. Wake up and do what you need to do. Don't be lazy. Don't slumber. Now is the time to wake up. Do you know what time it is? It's time to wake up. And he says in verse 15, So then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Circumspectly, that's another word for careful. Walk carefully. Be careful what you do. Be careful to avoid temptations. Don't be foolish, but be wise. And then verse 16, Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We are called here out of darkness into His light to walk as children of light. That means doing the will of the Lord. And it tells us in verse 16, redeeming the time. That word time, the Greek word, also is translated opportunity. In other words, he's saying, when he says redeem the time, he says, now is the season of opportunity. You have a chance right before you. Don't let it pass you by. If you have small children with you, now is your time to teach them about Christ. Don't let that opportunity pass you by. Don't wait till they grow up and rebel and then say, Oh, I wish they followed Christ. <laughs> now is your time. Redeem it. Take advantage while you can. What about you personally? What's your walk with the Lord like? I'm telling you, now is the time to get your relationship right with the Lord. Because we're about to see what are the times we live in. We live in the end times. We live in the end times. And it said right there in verse uh, 16, Redeem the time because the days are evil. The days we live in are evil. Therefore, don't be lazy. Don't put it off. Now is the day of your salvation. Now is the time to renew your relationship with, with the Lord. Now is the time to live for Him. Alright, now let's talk about the stork. Let's look in Jeremiah. If you would, turn to Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah was a prophet to ancient Israel. And God told Jeremiah, I want you to tell my people what they're doing wrong. And now, and now is the time to repent because judgment is coming to you. Judgment is on the way. So that's the times they lived in. Jeremiah 7. We find Jeremiah at the temple. And it says right here, verse 1, the, the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim there the word, this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter in these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. So what he's essentially saying is, Jeremiah, tell my people, listen up. Amend your ways. Now is the time to do it. The time for delaying is over. There is an army coming to invade you and take you captive. Don't put this off any longer. Do you know what time it is? Because here's the problem. They were trusting in false prophets and they, they thought things were just fine. Look in verse uh, 8. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know? And then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say... 
We are delivered to do all these abominations. The people had the audacity to do all those things and then still come to the temple and worship and say, God has delivered us. This sounds very similar to what Paul said in uh, Romans 6. Shall we keep on sinning so grace might abound? <laughs> is that how we get more grace? Let's do some more sinning? No! You've been saved and given grace in order to put to death the old man to not continue to sin. We shall not sin any longer. That was not what God has saved you for, is to continue in your sins. He saved you to pull you out of your sins, pull you out of darkness. Verse 22. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices, but this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it might be well with you. He's saying there... I want obedience more than sacrifice. We see that repeated several times in the Bible. What God really wants is your obedience, your trust in Him, that you will do as He wants you to do and make Him your God and no other gods. They were serving false gods. They were doing all those abominations. They weren't walking and serving for Him. I like what it says also, verse 24, Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsels and dictates of their evil hearts, and went backward and not forward. There's a proverb, 16.25, that reads, There is a way that seems right to man, but in its end it leads to death. This is what they were doing. By walking in their evil ways, they were marching right towards death. And if you look over in chapter 8, verse 3, chapter 8, verse 3, it says, Then death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of those who remain of this evil family, who remain in all the places where I have driven them, says the Lord of hosts. People were so wicked that they didn't realize what they were doing. They were choosing death over life. They didn't understand what time it was. They didn't understand that God was bringing punishment and judgment to them. That the way they were living was inviting death to them. They chose death over life. Because they were unaware of the times that they lived in. They were unaware that what they were doing, there was going to come a day of judgment for it. And that leads us down. I'm going to read verse 6. I listened and heard, this is God speaking, I listened and heard, but they do not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course. As the horse rushes into the battle, everyone rushed into doing what they wanted to do. But then verse 7, here's where it says, even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times. And the turtle dove and the swift and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. He's saying there that look at this animal, look at this bird. He knows what time it is. He knows when the temperature changes, I need to move. I need to go somewhere else where I can survive and be safe. He's saying this stork knows what time it is, but my people do not know that the time of judgment is at hand. They will not amend their ways. They will not repent. That's the time of judgment that's coming upon them because they're unaware what time it is. And my message to you today is, do you know what time it is for you? Your personal time, what season of life you're in, are you taking the time to do what God wants you to do? And what about the end times? Description of the end times can be found in 2 Timothy 
2 Timothy 3.1 reads like this, Know this, in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. We see all these things in the world we live in today. We, in fact, live in the last times. The time of the Lord's return is, is going to be here. And that begs the question, are you ready? Are you ready for the Lord's return? Because the time is at hand. Do you know what time it is? Uh, one last verse, Mark 13. If you would look at Mark 13. Christ here is talking about the last days. In Mark chapter 13, verse 24. <clears throat> Mark 13, 24, But in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars of heaven will fall, and the powers in the heaven will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with a great power and glory. And He will send His angels and gather together His elect in the four winds from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. Description of Christ's return. As he gathers those together. Are you ready for the Lord's return when He gathers those together? There are many who will say, Lord, haven't I done all these things in Your name? But God, He will say to them, Get away from Me, for I do not know You, you who practice lawlessness. Verse 28, Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and put forth leaves, you know the summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the doors. It's near. It's here. When you see these things, and we see these things in our world today, to know that it's near. Are you ready? Have you given your life to Christ? What is your relationship like with Christ? Do you take it seriously? Do you take time to be holy? Do you take time to share the gospel with others? Now is your season of opportunity. Do you take time to share the gospel with your children? Now is the season of opportunity. Do you know what time it is? If you realize what time it is, you will realize now is the time to get relationship with the Lord right and to share that with others. I pray today that you will realize now is your time of salvation. Now is your time to do what you are called to do. Would you please bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Our gracious and kind Heavenly Father, I pause right now to pray. Pray, Lord, for wisdom that we realize the times we live in and the time we need to take. to give our lives unto You and to do what You've called us to do. I pray that each and every one of us would realize not be lazy, not put off, but rather be diligent and take seriously what You've asked us to do and to live for You and to share that, that love with other people. Lord, I pray for those, my loved ones who are in the world who are unaware what time it is, that they would be convicted to come back to live for You. So I pray for my unsaved loved ones as I ask You to forgive all of us, bless us, see us safely through this next week, I pray, Lord, until we come together again. And I pray all these things in the name of Your Son, Jesus Christ, do I pray. Amen. God bless you.